thank you for having me here. Like Oliver said, my name is Michelle Ferreira. Um, I'm really excited to just stop this whole design mumble jumble you guys have been talking about and get us talking about numbers. Who's excited? No, sorry. Sorry. Uh, not convincing at all. Don't worry. I'm a designer at Booking.com. But I, I would like to try to explore the idea, though, that numbers may be the answer to the question of what is good design. And I'll start this talk then talking about numbers. The first number is going to be a very simple one, three. So I'm going to talk about three things about myself just so you can get to know myself a little better and we can get to know each other here. So my name, Michel Ferreira. It's a very tough name for most English-speaking people. Uh, the first time I did a conference, someone was about to introduce me and I said to the, to the announcer, you know, my name is Michel Ferreira. He went to the corner, he practiced, Michel Ferreira, Michel Ferreira, I can say it, I can do it. And then he walked on stage and said, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Ferrari. I was like, okay, it's fine, I don't own a Ferrari, I never designed a Ferrari, I have nothing to do with a Ferrari, but I mean, we're talking about good design, so it's worth a slide with a Ferrari, I guess, right? Uh, the second thing you should know about me, like I said, a designer for Booking.com, I've been in their headquarters in Amsterdam now for three and a half years, uh, it's been an amazing experience. I believe that this took my understanding of what design is and, of course, what testing and experimenting is to a max, and I would like to share that experience with you guys. The third thing is my blood type. And you might be wondering, why the hell is he telling me his blood type? Well, I didn't move to the next slide, but again, my blood type is B positive. And that's a mantra I tell to every experiment I ever start in my life. I start the experiments and I start B positive, B positive, B positive. It's going to work, B positive. One of the things you will probably learn from this talk, though, most experiments and in consequence, most designs fail. And you should learn that. You should appreciate that. You know, some fail dramatic, like this thing from the Mythbusters. I don't know if you guys can see it. You can. Awesome. So, like the Mythbusters, I've now come to accept that failure is always an option. And I feel a little bit like a Mythbuster myself. I know I don't look that cool. But I've been busting design myths at Booking.com with the help of data science. So, again, let's start with some more numbers so we can help each other here bust design myths. This number, does anyone recognize it? Anyone? Yeah? Cool. What do you think this is? The answer to life, the universe, and everything? Sorry. No, 42 languages is what we cover on Booking.com. So every time you do a design, any design on Booking.com, it has to work in 42 languages. I mean, that's already starting to tell you a story about the scope of every change that we do on our website, right? Second number. Oh, by the way, it's also a reminder to ask good questions because if not, you get the answer of 42. Um, the second number, 24. Again, 24 hours in a day. Well, we get a million bookings every 24 hours a day. And that helps us define that every time we're doing something, it cannot hurt that number. So there, just a slide of numbers to help you not, <laughs> to feel a little more overwhelmed about the, the scope of what we do. So booking, if you didn't know, is the third largest e-commerce in the world. Uh, we're the biggest accommodation website in the market. We sell about a million rooms every 24 hours. There's more than that, but there's no right number now. Um, we have more than a million properties here to search from. The website is in 42 languages. It's present in 224 countries. So again, every time you do a design change, you're talking about all these tech stuff, like the flex boxes and all these things. Imagine having to consider all of these things also. These are your users. These are the people that are touching your website. Um, also, we've been doing A-B testing for about nine to 10 years. And if that wasn't enough, we test all the things. I mean, literally, Anything you can think of has probably been tested on Booking.com multiple times. And I'm going to do something a little bit different here. I would like you guys to get up if you can. If you can humor me on this. <laughs> so it's part of our company culture that we do experimentation. This is going to be an experiment. I don't know if it's going to work or not. But what I'm going to try to do is if you think that version A of the experiment that I'm going to show you worked, you're going to bring your left hand up. If you think the version B of the experiment I'm going to show worked, you're going to show your right hand. And if you think none of them worked better, so it's inconclusive, you're just going to put no hand up. All good? All right, here's an experiment. Uh, version A on the left had just the reviews and the little message about the reviews. Version B on the right had the reviews, the message, and underneath it had this value for money message. Again, who thinks A left? Who thinks B right? And none of them, don't bring any arm up. Go. Right. Whoever said B, keep standing up. Whoever said A, sit down, please. Cool. We're going to go to the next slide. 
So we added this little tag that says booking.com is part of the Priceline group underneath the, lo underneath the logo. This was only for the U.S. market because the, in the U.S., Priceline is more well-known than booking.com, but not in the other markets. So if you think A, the first one with the Priceline logo one, you bring your left hand up. If you think B, no, lo no Priceline underneath, right hand up. And if none of them, inconclusive, just do nothing, please. Right, if you said A, please stand up. If you said B, please sit down. You see the amount of people standing up now? All right, guys, last one for you guys. This one. So you have version A on the top. Uh, can you spot the difference? Anyone? The deal thing jumps up from the, yes, okay. So you have a deal, this is a search result card, the deal logo was just below the book six times today message, and then we moved it up a bit. So what do you think? Version A, left hand, version B, right hand. Awesome. Who said A stands up? Who said B sit down? You guys are the only ones that had your gut answers work at this point. How many do we got standing up? About 10 people, maybe? Yeah, so that's the amount of chance that we're dealing with here. It's really hard to know a thing that will work, and you guys can sit down. I have books for you guys later if you want, like, little drawing books, so come talk to me after the, the talk. But it's really hard to know if something's going to work. So that's why when you look at this, you should know that we tested this thing thousands of times. All the time we're running thousands of experiments on this page. And you want to know how committed we are to A-B testing? We even have a tool to test our lunch. Not a joke. But why would we do that? So in the old days, we would have what we call a hippo, or the highest paid person in office. Uh, this person would walk into a room, and this is a real story. He would walk into a room and say like, hi man, I'm sorry, I don't like the design now. I would like you to change all the backgrounds to yellow. And you're like, I don't understand why. Don't worry, uh, you know, I'm the hippo, so go change it. And you're like, you know, this is me in 1997, no CM CMS, no CSS, no nothing. I go in, I change everything. Next day he comes in like, yeah, yellow was a little harsh of a color, wasn't it? Maybe we should do purple. I'm like, oh, come on, really? And then after a week of changing all the colors, the person decides that, yeah, gray was better. Let's go back to gray. So you just wasted thousands of hours to realize that, you know, he doesn't know what he's doing more than you do. And that's why we don't believe in doing that on Booking.com. We want to believe in data. We want to be data informed. So I'll try to show you the best practice of A-B testing and why the scientific approach is the way to go forward. Uh, I'm also going to tell you the pitfalls of this model. I, I don't see anything as black and white. And um, I'll start with the question of what is good design? Do you guys feel that good design is what makes the users feel good? Do you think it's what looks good? Is this what good design is? Maybe. We can bring the Ferrari back and just leave it there and call that good design. Or is this good design? Um, <laughs> So I asked Google what good design is, and Google told me this. Um, it's, see, very subjective. Um, design is full of bias and opinion, and probably your opinion of good, what good design is is not what my opinion of good design is. We can have huge discussions here about tabs versus spaces, flex boxes versus grids. I mean, I don't know. We can just stay here all day and talk about it. But the worst part is that because we studied this, we're more biased than anyone else. We are the experts, and that can make us snobs about it. Um, it's really hard because we can believe that we know it all. If we allow ourselves to just, <laughs> if we allow ourselves to just go into these discussions, um, like I said, how do we focus back on what is important for the users? They are not the designers, right? We we are the designers. We should focus on them. And I believe A/B testing ha is the way to not only allow you to focus on them, but also to test your ideas and validate them faster. The other problem with A-B testing is that there's a lot out there about A-B testing. And most of the things that are out there are probably wrong. Um, anyone here heard of the example from Google that is the 42 colors of blue? Anyone heard of that term? So 42 colors of blue, back in the day, Google was testing 42 colors of the same button with a different blue to see which one of them worked. Is that an A-B test? No, that's a multivariate test. It has too many variates. So an A-B test is one version versus another. But we'll get into that. If you like this talk, what I would like you to get out of it is that you should disrupt your perfect design process and not lock yourself into a room and design something for six months and then forget about the design until you actually show it to the users. You should really feel like you should get up and running in days, not months. 
So my friend Jay is going to erase your guys' uh, m memories of A-B testing right now. Everything that you know about A-B testing is going to be erased, and we're going to start from scratch. All right. A-B testing. 50% of your traffic is randomly assigned to 50% of a... 50% of your traffic is shown a version of the web page. So 50% sees version A, 50% sees version B. Oh, but I ran it differently. I ran it before and it was 100% of people saw this website and then 100% of these people saw the other website and then we compare them. Well, you didn't do an A-B test. You show them to two different user bases. An A-B test has to be a random variation between two, the same user set into two different versions of the site. And we do this because we want to find, uh, we want to compare a variation which we anticipate will have a, an effect in a specific metric. Metrics can be anything you can measure, right? So it can be conversion rate, bounce rate, time spent on page, number of clicks, how long it takes to complete a task, that's up to you. You define what you want to measure. But that's, that's how we do an A-B test. So I'm going to start with a very simple example, and please do not try this at home. Um, a page on our website, booking.com landing page, has a blue call to action. This is what we call control. And we're going to measure against that. The variation, the, the new call to action is green. So we run the A-B test, and then we check the data afterwards to see which version had a positive or a negative effect, like you guys were doing standing up. If this change has been, had been implemented without using an A-B test, you would never know if this had any effect. Worst, you would never know why it had an effect. So now I'm going to show you another number, 37. 37 signals. So 37 signals redesigned themselves, the entire company, to be called the Basecamp company. Have you, do you guys know 37 signals? Okay. So when they rebranded to be Basecamp, they redesigned their entire website, right? But they had Basecamp the product, and they had to redesign it to be Basecamp the company. Uh, so this story is back in 2014 when they officially became this company. There was complete rebranding, changing the entire website. As part of the process, when they did this new marketing website, they didn't notice that they removed the sign-up form from the homepage. No one noticed that back at the time. So what they shared after that is that it took a long time for them to conclude that there was a decline in sign-ups that they saw for the entire summer of 2014. The problem is seasonality comes into play and they usually have less signups in the summer. So they didn't realize, again, that the form was what caused that. They only thought, well, you know, we had less because it's summer. Uh, then one of their analysts and one of the, uh, the designers wrote on their blog that the marketing site conversion rate in 2014 was, took a, a big decline with the launch of the new post-becoming Basecamp marketing site. In January, the conversion rate was 1.06. And in February, it was 0.89%. And they thought, well, that's partially due to higher traffic. We changed the name. We brought out a lot of attention to the website. People came in. So higher traffic, lower conversion. But they also noticed that absolute signups fell about 10%. And it, they haven't improved. So when they noticed that, what do they do now? They're like, okay, we can't prove anything. We didn't do an A-B test. How do we fix this? So it is, they took a long time to decide this, by the way. And then when they really got to a decision, they said, let's do an A-B test. Let's bring it back. Let's put a sign-up form on the homepage. And I don't know if you can see there right in the middle. There's when they run the A-B test and when they end the A-B test. So when they run the A-B test with the form on the homepage, sign-ups increase by 16%. And the impact when they finish it Basically, when you finish your test, you decide that it's good for everyone, and then you put it from 50% to 100%. They saw that the increase on signups is huge at that point. Um, and the, the, the reasons that they believe you should never do anything, like Ida said yesterday, don't never show, it, never show a design you haven't tested. Never put a design on the website that you haven't A-B tested. This is what Basecamp said. Because one, you never know what will work. There's no way to know what will work. Basically, an A-B test would have likely caught the lower performance in the beginning. Uh, in a couple of weeks, you would be able to see if the seasonality effects were there. Seasonality would be aff affecting both versions of your experiment because it's the same seasonality for both versions. You have 50% of traffic in each. And the second thing is that companies don't communicate effectively. So if a, big co if a, if a company like Basecamp can have one designer decide to remove that form and then lose this much money, it's important for you to figure out can, can I learn from this and can I not lose these many millions of dollars while doing this? So the way that we do this in booking.com is through the, what we call design of experiments and it's a scientific term. I'm not a data scientist so I'm going to try to explain it the best I can. 
Um, design of experiments is a systematic, systematic method to determine the relationship between factors affecting a process and the output of that process. In other words, it's used to find cause and effect relationships. So in plain English, we only use experiments to test an idea and make sure their effect is not caused by chance or by external factors. Like Basecamp was saying, they didn't know if it was seasonality, they didn't know if it was the change, they weren't able to see it. And because I'm not a data scientist, I think that it's too complicated to explain it like that, so I came up with five steps that should make it really easy for you to know what to do. So these are the simple five steps to building any A-B test. We make observations, we formulate a hypothesis, we design and conduct an experiment, we evaluate the result of that experiment, and then we accept or reject the hypothesis. And that sounds like the scientific method, because it is. It's exactly what it is. We're here talking about science in the, in the royal institution, just because, you know, why not, right? But um, let's try to think about this in design. Try to change it to the terms of design and try to think of this in this way. So we make observations. We show our users our, our, our websites, our products. Have, have everyone, anyone here done a user test before? This is how it feels when you do a user test for the first time. So you show your user, <laughs> I know, five, five people, by the way, you, you notice, right? We showed them to five. Um, <laughs> we start by observing the user behavior, either during user research or by looking at the available data on the website. So yeah, user research is awesome, but sometimes you don't have time to do user research or you don't have a budget to do user research. So you either do the guerrilla ta tactics that Ida was talking about yesterday or you just go out and look at your Google Analytics, look at any other tool you have at your disposal and try to learn from it. Really try to identify the user pain or the user pain point and think on how you can improve their overall experience. Those are the things you should be fixing. You as a designer should be focusing not on the technology but on, on what is the pain point of my user and how do I fix that. Then the second step is we formulate a hypothesis. So hypothesis can be really simple. It can be literally, if we modify the copy on the register button, we expect more users will create accounts because of how simpler it is to understand the new message. That can be a hypothesis. We can also be a little bit more specific. If we increase the size of a button, we will get more users to complete their purchase because it improves readability. Or you can do something technical. So again, uh, as long as you can measure it, you can do it. My technical improvement was if I remove all the extra image calls on a page, it will reduce load time. And if it reduces load time, the shopping the cart will load faster, people will go down faster down the funnel and will increase conversion. Uh, when formulating ideas though, the most important part is trying to make them smart. Ideas should be smart. They should be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and timely. And if you ask smart questions, you get smart answers. And those would be very important because you are in charge of reviewing the data afterwards. So if you don't know what the answer is telling you, all you get is 42, right? So why we do specific? Because you target a specific area, you want a specific goal, it makes it more, uh, it makes it easier to, to be specific and to know like the narrow area that you're trying to be focused on. Um, you can ask six questions to be even more specific. You can ask who, what, where, when, which, and why. That way you really define what you're trying to fix. Uh, it should be measurable. You have established concrete criteria to measure the progress. It should be achievable. If you're doing something that you don't think it's going to be achievable, you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, it should be realistic. Again, same problem with achievable. And timely. Things should be timed. You should know how much time you're going to spend on this. And after you define all of these questions, you should know what the answers are you're looking for so you can move to the next step. The next step is designing and building your idea. And I'm not gonna teach anyone to build your own designs. You are all designers or developers. You all know how to build this. That's all fine and good. But what I'm gonna tell you though is that execution can be the killer of a good idea. It can make or break your, your experiments. So if you start by accepting since the beginning of it that most experiments will fail, it will, it will be, you will be able to, to perform more tests, you will do them faster, and you will learn from your failures. And my, my way of saying this very simply is iterate, rinse, repeat. That's it. So I'm, I, like I said, Booking.com, right? This is Stuart Frisbee, design director of Booking.com. When I joined, I had a lot of ideas and I was like, man, I'm going to build this thing. It's going to be amazing. It's for the book process. And I was on the book process team. I was 
coming up with all these crazy ideas. I'm going to make a shopping cart uh, in one step instead of three steps. I'm going to make these uh, credit cards that look like credit cards and they flip when you touch them or something. And every time I came up with an idea, I heard that, you know, Stuart already tried it or, you know, Stuart already thought of that. And I was like, really? That's, that sucks, you know, what, what do I do now? You know, I felt really bad as a designer. So then I went to him, you know, and I said, hey, man, you know, I need, I need advice. What, what do I do? And Stuart looked at me really seriously, um, and he said, Michelle, you should know one thing. I am a shit designer. <laughs> and he didn't mean it, though. What he meant to say was that if you understand that what he designed is in his way, and what I designed has my own way of thought, that frees you up to try things in your own way. Execution is not concept. The fact that we thought about the same idea does not mean that we're going to implement it in the same way. So step four, you evaluate the results. To help you develop and perform strong experiments, you need to understand a little bit about sample size and effect size. Again, I know math. I'm not really a math person, but let me try to give you the idea here. Sample size is the more visitors you have, the less time there is to achieve confidence of the st statistical significance of the hypothesis. So the, the biggest the website, the website, the easiest it is to measure things. If you have a small effect size, something like 0.1 increase in conversion rate, then you, don't need, you will need a very large sample size to determine that. Large effects can be validated with a smaller sample size. But here's the curveball on that. You checked all your numbers, you went to online calculators, which by the way, I'm gonna post on my slides, online calculators, so you can know how much time you have to run your experiment. Um, and it tells you that you have to run for, let's say, a week. And we're gonna call that a business cycle here. So you have to run your experiment for one week. And what I tell you th is this, can you remember what happened this Friday? Can anyone remember what happened on August 5th, 2016? That was the Olympics. That was the beginning of the Olympics in Rio. So do you think your customers' behaviors will always be the same in every given week? And the answer is no, right? Unplanned events or planned events even will change the way that your customers behave. And users' behaviors being affected in unexpected ways is, is why I recommend that we always have to run our experiments for two full business cycles. And they have to be full, by the way. You can't just say like, oh, I was running it for a week, but I got statistical significance in less than a week. So fine, it's good. Let's call it quits. Put it on the website for everyone. That doesn't really work. I'm going to show you a simulation of this. So what this simulation is going to try to do, again, uh, it's a little crude the way it looks, but what it's trying to do is it's going to run 100 experiments and show you which ones were ever significant and which ones ended up being significant in the end. Uh, you might be thinking, well, this is a video. You probably faked this. Um, I'm going to run it a couple more times. <laughs> so the first time, uh, 70 experiments were ever significant, so they were either positive or negative at any given point that is not the end point of the experiment. So if you turned it on or off at that point, you were wrong. Only 15 of those ended up significant. Does that make sense? So if I show it again, you now have this one, which is going to run again another 100 experiments. It's not going to turn out the same way. It's always going to be random. And that's why we're trying to find cause and effect. If you stop things before you know the correct response, you're doing it wrong. It's going to run again. And you can find this online, by the way. If you, if you Google that repeated significance testing simulation, you're going to find it online, or you can look it up on my slides. Cool, it's going to end now with 100 experiments, 67 significant, 12 that end as significant. All right. So... In the end, the fifth step is you look at the data and you accept or reject the hypothesis, right? So analyzing the data and figuring it out is your job. You should accept that the data is not the captain of the ship. It doesn't seize control. It doesn't tell you things. Data is only there to give you support and backing and to provide learnings. You develop the hypothesis, you conduct the experiment, and more importantly, you analyze the data. So if you believe that data-driven design is a thing, you're wrong, it's usually the idea is design-driven data analysis. Design drives the idea, and then we analyze the data to validate that idea. You review your question that you asked in the beginning to see if the answer is now obvious. Do you see an, a, an improvement, a positive difference? Was there an obvious negative impact in the metric you were aiming for? Does it show no results, so we call it inconclusive? Well, when we're analyzing the data, usually what you get is something like this. And if you remember to ask 
the smart questions and I said you're going to get smart answers, it's even more important to think about that because really your answers look like this. It's either yes, no, or goodbye, right? Uh, you're trying to read the user's body language in a way. The user is navigating your website and you're trying to understand what they were trying to tell you and all you can see is it turned positive, it turned negative, or nothing. So if your data showed that B is better than A, you celebrate and you go like, yes, turn it full on, share it to every one of your users. This not all, it doesn't happen all the time, so you should be really happy. But how about an example, a real one? Everyone probably heard of this one. Um, if, you've never, if you haven't been living under a rock for the past two years, you've heard discussions about hamburger menus, right? But um, what we're going to do here is, do you believe that it's a bad thing? How do we prove that the hamburger menu is a bad thing? Um, like I, I said, I, I'm a myth buster. So I, what I thought when I saw this was like, all these websites are talking about it. And I worked on the mobile website at booking.com. So all I had was third-party data. Everyone told me, all the experts told me, oh yeah, hamburger menus are horrible. They don't use them. How not to use them? Avoid hamburger menus. Here's the data that I saw online. Um, like I said, not my data, some data that is available online. It was tweeted out and it got me really interested in the subject. But I wonder how would this perform at the booking.com scale? We don't, we don't do things for one language, we do it for 42. We don't do it for one country, we do it for you know, 20, 224 countries. And when I looked at his experiment, which this is shared online, uh, it says that the hamburger menu was shown to 120,000 users and the word menu to 121,000. Uh, that's less than an hour probably in, in our scale. So I thought, okay, this is going to be an interesting experiment. So we ran that and there's a huge blog post on, on booking.com about it. Who thinks, again, who thinks A1? Who thinks the hamburger menu is the best? Who thinks the menu word is the best? <laughs> Anyone? Okay. None of it. N nothing. No change. Completely inconclusive. And you're going to think about that and you're going to go, oh, okay, well, inconclusive. That doesn't sound good. What do we, you know? Well, the pitfall or the common mistake to do when something is inconclusive is to believe that an inconclusive experiment means a neutral effect. And therefore, you consider that an acceptable result. And you just go like, okay, it's inconclusive, so I'm going to turn the new version full on and send it to everyone. But if you had done that, you would have believed in the data that they were sharing before, which was, well, the, the menu is better. In this case, all that you proved is that you can't measure the impact of the hamburger menu on your users. So what I'm proving with this experiment is that my users do not see a difference between the hamburger menu and the word menu. And we tried to break it down in all different segments, different languages, different countries. Nothing changed. Yes, we didn't try it in 42 languages because I don't think the word menu in Greek would fit there. I'm not sure. I know it in Portuguese, it's menu, but you know, maybe it wouldn't work. But um, there will be cases where you see differences in your metrics that you cannot explain and you shouldn't accept that just for, for any reason. We had a hypothesis to test there and the hypothesis was, are you going to click more on the menu than on the hamburger? No, you didn't. Are you going to convert less because there's a menu word there or there's a hamburger there? No, they didn't. So I have to accept then that there was no difference in keep the hamburger menu. You also have to use your design intuition though. You have to try to understand what the data is trying to say. It's important that you understand that just because something is positive doesn't mean that it's good. You have to try to relate the positive effect to your hypothesis. So there's no such thing as magic. No one's going to just tell you what is good and what is bad. Yes, you want your results to be positive, but more important than the positive, you want them to be true. At Booking, we do small steps. We optimize everything on the website in very small steps. And the reason we do that is not because we're obsessive about A-B testing or we're obsessive about, about every detail of what we do. We want measurable steps. We want everything to be validated to lead to a better product. If you validate every step of the way, you will know how to get there the next time. Also, rather than improving one thing 10%, which is really, really hard, we go out and we find a thousand things that we can improve a fraction of a percent, which is much more achievable. If you try to optimize one thing at a time, actually more than one thing at a time, you will fail to produce results that you can repeat and the, those results won't, you won't teach you anything. So if I ran this test and with the blue button there, I change it to the green button with the little tick next to it, 
if it went positive, you, wouldn't, you, you won't know if the image or the color change made the positive effect. Would you be able to tell me which one was the success? Worse than that, considering that most tests fail, if you had a negative result, would you be able to say to your colleagues with confidence that users prefer pages without images and without blue buttons? You wouldn't because you don't know. You tested two things and two things are more complex and the more things you add makes it more complex. You have to remember to design like you're right but test like you're wrong. Always assume that you could be wrong so when you're testing. And why do I believe that the key to good design is testing? Well, good design is subjective like I said before, but worse than that, define good design. Uh, we, we will never agree on a number of things as designers. Is, is Helvetica a good font? Does anyone here like Comic Sans? I know a lot of people at Booking that do, by the way. Uh, the problem is no one is ever right. There's always subjectivity tied to it. So what working with data teaches us is that the, you know, the idea is that you're never solely testing a UI element by itself. It's never just a trend or a pattern or an element. You're testing these things against a very specific user base in a very specific scenario. So when I'm saying that I'm busting a myth, in reality what I'm doing is I'm learning what works for Booking.com users. And this may or may not work for your users, and that's fine, that's totally the reason why we A-B test anyway. We wanna know that, we want, we want to learn that the findings of others, expert opinion, data from other websites, or any hypothesis you can dream up, are all unproven and should be run against our customers. You should observe users, you should observe data, you should learn from what's out there. But when you learn that and you bring it to your own designs, you should try to test it on your own specific users to see if for them it works. Do, the, you, do your users like carousels? Do your users understand hamburger menus? Would, would Flexbox work for them? So if you accept that you know nothing, it's much easier to accept that there's no way you will know that a design will work on the real world. You can't just look at a design and go like, I know, that one's great, that's perfect. Just ship it, it's fine. You will never know that. It's always worth testing your ideas and learning what the, the questions that the data will bring. My message to all of you here is that A-B testing helps remove the opinions out of the equation. You can come in with an idea, whatever idea it is, and you have gotten it, again, from user testing, from talking to your users, from doing surveys, Surveys can be really biased, but again, you can have ideas from that, that's fine. What you do with that is you build your ideas, the ones that you believe are good for your users. You come up with an educated guess of what you believe is good. The users will show you the answer, they will point out the way. What we come up with is a democracy of good ideas. Your job is to use your design and problem solving skills to make these ideas better. And the entire goal of your design process shifts from trying to find better things to build to just solving your customers' issues and giving them all the things that you believe that will make their experience better. Refining those experiments, uh, re <laughs> refining those experience, making experiments to make that small step grow into a, a better and better experience all the time. And I understand that that doesn't sound very easy, but that's fine. Because design, good design, shouldn't be easy anyway. You know, good design is hard. Yeah.